Yo, what is going on everybody? Dan Tramty here and welcome back to my tutorial series on Browser Noise. This is tutorial number 11 and we have something that is starting to resemble a user interface for our drum machine. We have a slider to adjust the tempo and we have a can canvas that displays the beat, but let's make it so that when we click the canvas, when we you know point our cursor to a specific cell, we can adjust the beat according to where we click on the canvas. Let's do it. First, I wanna show that we can create an event listener on our canvas. Think of the canvas like any other DOM element we've used, like sliders, buttons, select menus. If we assign our canvas to a variable, then we can call the mouse pressed method on our canvas. Let's go up here and declare a variable canvas, something like that and then assign our canvas to that variable by saying cnv equals create canvas. Now we can attach a mouse press listener, mouse pressed, and we'll define a callback function in here. I already know that there's going to be a lot happening in this callback, so rather than making it a local function, let's give it a name like canvas pressed and then define that function at the very bottom of the page down here. And then check to see if it works by saying console.log. And you know what we'll put in here? Mouse Y, because we're gonna wanna start checking to see where our mouse positions are when we click the canvas. So we'll start by looking at the Y axis. So I'm gonna run that. And if you see, if I touch at the top of the canvas, like near the top, it's a small number. And then if I t click near the bottom, it's a relatively large number, um, somewhere between zero and 60, because that's what the height of our canvas is, right? 60. So right now, what I want to do is target the row that I'm clicking. And so the way I'm going to do that is to divide mouse Y by the height and let's see what happens. Now when I click on the canvas, it's somewhere in the range of zero and one, right? Now, if I multiply that by three, you'll see that when I run it, if I click somewhere in the top row, it's going to be zero point something, right? If I click somewhere in the second row, it'll be one point something. And if I click in the third row, it'll be two point something. Uh, because we're getting a range of zero to three, if that makes sense. Now, if I call the floor function on that, you'll see that what it does is it will truncate those decimal values and, or, or you can think of it as rounding down to the integer zero, one, or two. So let's re rerun that and look at this. If I hit anywhere in the top row, it'll be a zero. Anywhere in the second row, it'll be a one. Anywhere in the third row, it'll be a two. Fab. Now let's grab all of that and store it in a local variable called row clicked, like so. And now we can fire code depending on which row we click just by using if statements. So if row clicked equals zero, then we can say the first row has been clicked. Let me just do that by consoling a consoling console.logging a string called first row and run that. Now you see if I click anywhere in the first row, we get first row in our console. But if I click anywhere else, nothing happens. So we can grab that, copy it two more times, um, and replace the zero with a one here and a zero with a two here. And this will be the second row. This will be the third row. Hit that run button. Boom, first row, boom, second row, boom, third row. Excellent. We can also make these else if statements, um, which is maybe a little nicer. Uh, let me see if I reformat it, it'll work. No, okay, we can just do this, clean it up a little bit. Um, there we go and hit run, we are in good shape. Now I wanna go through a very similar process on the x-axis, whereas we target the cells by taking the floor of 16 times mouse x over width, like that, and then we'll store that into a local variable called index clicked. 
just to show what that does, if I were to go to my first row and uh, add a little space there, add index clicked, and then hit run. And now you can see if I click on the very first uh, cell, we have first row zero, first row one, first row two, all the way up to first row 15. Excellent. Okay, now this part is kind of cool. Since we've made this variable called index clicked, we can use that to point to different indices of our pattern arrays and then just sort of inject a new value into it. So let's do that to our hi-hat pattern by saying hpat at index clicked equals and uh, currently they're all ones. So let's, let's make it so that it turns it to a zero. So now let's run and then let's press play. Oh yeah. And now if I click one of these, Okay, that's amazing. Notice I made it so that at index one, five, nine, and 13 are actually zeros. It doesn't look like it. It's not displayed like that because uh, we haven't updated the display, but we've altered our beat with the click of a mouse. Awesome. Before we move on, I want to quickly fix that um, display issue because the lack of feedback when I click on the canvas and I don't see anything changing, that is that feels wrong to me. So what we need to do is make it so that when we click the canvas, right after the array gets updated, we draw the background, the grid, and all the notes again. So we need to refresh that display. And so we could just go up to the bottom of our setup function right here, starting with when we draw the background, and then we go through all these for loops to make the grid, and then uh, draw the notes. We can copy and paste all of that and put it at the bottom of our canvas pressed function, but I think what would be better is if we encapsulate it into a single function so that we can just invoke that one function. Let's do that. This is gonna be easy. We just need to go to the very bottom and define a function called draw matrix, like so. And then in the setup function, whenever we do all of that draw stuff, like from here, starting at the background to the very end of the setup function, we'll go ahead and cut that and drop it right into our draw function, like so. Now, if we hit run, you'll see that we're not drawing our matrix at all, but that's because we don't, we're defining draw matrix, but we're not ever invoking draw matrix. So we just need to go to where we drew it in the setup and simply say draw matrix like that, and then hit run and you'll see when it reads this line of code, it actually refers down to here to figure out what it has to do and then draws the entire matrix. And now when we want to draw our matrix in the canvas press, we don't have to rewrite all of that code. We simply have to invoke draw matrix. And now let's run that. And when I click some of these notes on the top row, they disappear. Amazing. All right, we're a few steps closer. We can erase the hi-hat part, which is useful in a drum machine, I guess. But we want to not just be able to set ones to zeros in our arrays. We want to be able to set zeros to ones. In fact, what we really want to do is toggle the state of the index number we're clicking on. So if it's a one, we want a zero. If it's a zero and we click on it, we want a one. There's like, honestly, a million different ways to do this. You can use if statements, you can use math. Hold on. All right, I completely nerded out just now. I made a new sketch to demonstrate a function that I defined called invert. And what invert does is it outputs to console a zero in the case that we input a one. So if I hit run with one here, it outputs a zero. If I input a zero, it outputs a one. This is precisely what we need to toggle the states of our notes. Now, 
I feel like this is the obvious solution uh, to this sort of problem set. If you if you write out the problem in the English language, you will probably use an if statement, right? You'll think if we have an input of one, then we want an output of zero. Else we want an output of one. And then that's what I do right here. I say if bit input is one, then output zero, else output one. We can of course use this in our drum machine to toggle the states of the notes. And you might even go ahead and try and do that right now. But let's comment that out and look at a really concise way of doing the exact same thing. It doesn't look like it, but this is a shorthand if statement. You can read it like this. Is our input equal to one? If yes, then return zero. Else return one. And you can see it works. If I hit run while there's a zero in there, it outputs a one. If I put in a one, it outputs a zero. Next. This one is similar, but rather than asking if our input is equal to one, like the example before, if we just ask the question, bit input? <laughs> Even though our input is in the form of a one or a zero, it would be implied that we're dealing with Booleans because questions like this ought to evaluate to true or false. So JavaScript will interpret a zero as false and a non-zero as true and then evaluate the if statement accordingly. It still works. If I run it with a one here, it outputs as a zero. If I run it with a zero, it outputs as a one. Next, we can use math. If the input is a one, then negative one plus one is zero. If the input is a zero, then zero plus one is a one. Next, this caret symbol right here is an XOR bitwise operator that returns a one if either of our operands are a one, but not if both of them are. Next, look how concise this is, OMG. Because our input is preceded by this not operator, our zero or one input is again interpreted as a Boolean and then negated, okay? Then this plus sign casts it back to a 64-bit integer. It's a miracle that this thing works, but obviously it does. In the case of a one, it outputs a zero. In the case of a zero, it outputs a one. I love it. And we're going to use it in our sketch because it's just so satisfying to me. Um, but you can use any one of the ones we went over. Do note that this one, <laughs> we're kind of abusing uh, JavaScript's type polymorphisms here um, because we're casting it back from booleans to integers and blah, blah, blah. It's not necessarily the best solution if you're going for performance, but in this case, to be honest, it's not a big deal. We're just flipping bits one at a time. That's the least of our browser's worries, okay? Back to our drum machine, instead of setting hpat at index clicked to zero, we'll set it equal to plus not hpat at index clicked, like so, and then grab that, copy it down to our clap and our base, and then swap out our arrays accordingly, like this. I think if I do this, yeah, bpat, hit run, Not too bad for about 100 lines of code. See you in the next one. Later. <laughs>